morning, good afternoon, good evening, from Michigan, LA, UK, Madrid, uh, and from India as well, from New Delhi. Thank you so much for being here. I am Marin Troini, Global Chair for Global Networking, and this is a new edition of Physical Stereotypes, an effort that we made with openness and wisdom and global networking. Why we did, we did it that way? Because we need to print with wisdom what means a global networking, especially because it's virtual. We have identified very harmful physical stereotypes and only one concept of what means beauty. And it's not that we are trying to reivindicate ugliness. No, 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 no. We are trying to search for the beauty, the inner beauty in all of us, to the right to be ourselves, and not that it became a challenge. We have seen that these physical stereotypes, this Photoshop that we seem to have to do it all the time, have to be only a technical tool and not to Photoshop our authenticity. And that the impact, the negative impact of that is not that we have created a beautiful world. No, it's what we create psychological problems on the people. We create bullying. We create many, many traumatic experiences. Also, this good image of physical stereotypes force many people to enter into a breakdown, a psychological breakdown, because they can't follow that pattern. It's okay for us if someone wants to be in that mood, but it's, we need to be open, tolerant, and respect others. We are a platform that empowers women. We give power to the woman, and the power to the woman is not to follow, to replicate a model pre-established community, is to be herself, what she wanted to be. We wanted to revindicate what is individual freedom. We are going to talk about that with these beautiful ladies from all over the world. I, you know, I always say that because I am so proud of that, that they are all over the world and they are here in this small screen, but so big on ideas and on strength. We have been challenged to change this cultural code that is part of our society. So we move one step forward in what means our organization, not just to empower individuals, but also to leave a message for future generation of what means a very negative and harmful cultural code of what means beauty. Today we have a very special guest that is Sue Kur from, from UK. Is here and all of, of not only Sue but the rest of, of, of the of these ladies. You will see that they are experts, very important professional and good professional on their fields, and also they will tell you what is their personal experience of what means with physical stereotypes. All of them. So you know this this is a wolf that we have here, and so please appreciate that. Sue Kur. Sukur, that is our guest speaker, is a mental well-being mindset specialist. She's on a mission to empower one million women to reframe the way they see themselves and their situation in order to break free from societal norms and reclaim their life to live freely where it matters most, inside the mind that is theirs and theirs alone to control. So we are going to go back to you uh, later. Would you would like to say something now, please? Uh, absolutely. Uh, firstly, Mark, thank you very much for having me, for inviting me on. Um, the, the fact that I managed to master my uh, technological stereotype and actually get on camera is a bonus. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and sharing sharing the platform with, with so many esteemed colleagues, who um, many of whom I've already met personally and, and all of whom I'm... I'm blessed and honored to share the platform with today. So thank you very much. You are so, so welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. We are going to, to come back with, with, uh, with Sue, but now we are going to start from Canada. Our national chair for She Hendrick Owners and Wisdom, that is Paula Alphonse. She's a transformation facilitator. You can imagine how important it is if we wanted to change a cultural code to have a coach on transformation. <laughs> is what we need to become more healthy, mental, and not only physical. Paula is an awarded international transformation speaker 
a personal leadership educator. And she defined herself and a status quo disruptor, what I love. <laughs> She's the host of her own show, Getting Real with Paula. So, Paula, the floor is all yours. We are going to get real with you today. <laughs> hello, 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 everyone. And thank you for being here for me this morning, for all of you all over the world. It could be afternoon, it could be evening. So we're talking about the challenge to be yourself. And what I would start by saying is that as a society, women are raised to be nice, to fit in, to do not make waves and no conflict, don't start any controversy. So all of this create those limitations in the way we behave in public, but also in our own homes. And until we are aware of that, it just creates those little bit of irritants and we're wondering what is that? In my, in my case, as uh, Mara's mentioned, I'm a status quo disruptor. So which means ever since I was a child, the first question when you asked me to do something would be, well, why? So I grew up my whole life about why, why, why. And as I majored, if we could call it, call it into life, you realize, you know what? Some of these don't belong to me. It belongs to other people. If that's fine for them, that's okay. But the person that I want to be might not be the person that has to follow all of those rules. So this is about finding out who you are and how do you show you true self. So that's pretty much me. And I'm looking forward to this conversation with the rest of my friends here. Ah, I can't hear you anymore. Mar, I think you are muted. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say the same. <laughs> Somebody's microphone, some of, if, if your microphones have got a red mark through them, they're muted. Ah, sorry. Sorry, yes. We have Tanya Mekdot. Uh, she's our Michigan chair of She Hundred of Omniness and Wisdom. He's owner of Infocus Coaching Services, a certified life coach and a coach on ethical matters. Tanya, you are very welcome once again. Uh, do you think there is a problem of ethics here with these physical modern stereotypes? Good morning, Mara and everyone. Yes, I do think it is. It is an invasion and an intrusion on a personal's personal space, in my opinion. We're all unique and we all have gifts and ways of presenting ourselves to the world that are unique to us. And why did someone else get a chance or have the right to tell us what's wrong or right or what it is we should do? It's really challenging because as Paula mentioned, there are these societal norms and what others believe beauty is and what we as women have often heard uh, about being demure, looking a certain way and looking a certain way so you can attract a mate and all of these types of things. But what's most important is that you're taking care of you you're healthy in your own skin and in your own space. And that's what you're presenting to the world. Thank you so much, Tanya. We continue in U.S. And now we are switched into what we what is a G100 a Global Networking and our national chair or U.S. national chair for Global Networking. That is Bridget Tan, our dearest Bridget Tan. Uh, that, that is a certified grief transformation coach 
founder and president of the International Childhood Cancer Charity, the author of the book Seeking Peace. He is also an international speaker and oncologist. Bridget, how are you? Thank you, Mari. It's an honor and a delight to be here. And yes, in we, we all of us sometimes has growing up. Growing up, it seems like I can I did not grow up in the United States. But even when you grow up in different society, and sometimes even more when you grow up in different society, we are told to be this way and that way, and have all the magazines out there. And the TV that shows us what the public perceives to be uh, to be with us, and all of this can sometimes have you ever feel this? Perhaps not right now, but even in the near past, a bit of an angst, a bit of an unsettling feelings in you. And if that so, grief by definition is the unsettling feelings that caused by changes. And so it is something that we want you want to um, be aware of. As you navigate the, your freedom from not allowing people to physically stereotype, not allowing yourself to be physically stereotyped. Yeah. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, you see that we are good, we are adding elements, you know, different different countries, different religions, different personal experience. So now let's go to India now, and and let's see what they have to say about this. Abhirami Vivek is our dear our dear speaker also today he's a counseling psychologist we need a psychologist we we, we have to say psychology is very important of physical stereotype he's founder director of magnet minds preschool and after school care he's also vice chair of wiki india and chairperson of tamil all ladies league i'm sure i'm missing something more of you Abhidami. uh but but we, we need we need to, to make it shorter how are you I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Mar, and everybody. It's it's always nice to meet you all. And you know, like this is one of the topics which I really like, and uh, I'm truly honored to talk on this. So when it comes to physical stereotyping, it is the physical attractiveness stereotype is a tendency to assume that people who are physically attractive also possess other desirable personality traits. But I think it's not required that uh, we need to go along with that. And uh, as they say, not all five fingers are same. So we accept our own five fingers. And without that, we are not able to do it. Like that, you know, like we have to have the differences only then, you know, it will be nice. Uh, so putting somebody into a particular uh, uh, stereotype is not required. Let's be ourselves. Uh, like others said, like inner self and you know, your your happiness is more important than anything else. That's what I would. A different continent, a different religion, and from a psychology. So it's not us who say it. It's a it's, it's really something that is happening all over the world. You know, we have experts to support us on that on the negativity of of, of what means physical stereotypes. And we have uh, our lovely Shiva Shetty. That we love her, and she is our national chair for for global networking. Uh, she has, I, I will, I will say, the human capital investor, lead consultant of Elite India Consulting, president of corporate communication and advocacy council wiki. But uh, for me, and why um... well, she she was so perfect for us that Shira Shira uh, is is able to to combine her personal experience, her expertise. And, and send us message of full of wisdom. You can imagine how empowering it is to have Shira with us. So Shira, the floor is yours. I don't know if there is something technical with you. A technical problem, no? We cannot hear you, Shira. She lost connection, I think so. Okay, let, let's move forward and then, and then sh until Shira came back. Shira? No, no, Chica. Okay, Sue, what do you think about all this? You know, different countries, as I said, yeah, different uh, countries. Hello, everyone. Uh, my apologies. Unfortunately, my, my uh, Wi Fi is kind of. Yes, we, we, we cannot hear well, uh, Shira. Is cut it. Okay, 
let, let, let's wait until Shira uh, uh, is able to, to come back. Sue, go ahead, please. Is my voice audible? <laughs> yes, we can hear you, Shreya. We can't see you. Yes. Uh, let, let, let's wait. Let's wait and, until uh, Shira, Shira could fix that. Yes, Sue, please, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, I completely concur with everything that everybody said thus far. Um, I think we as women and, and as men, to be fair, wherever we are in the world, we, we are primed from the second that we enter the world to become okay. something that is um, a projection of what our parents and our families would want for us. And the majority of them do so with the best of our interests at heart. But nevertheless, we very quickly if we're not careful and mindful, we very quickly fall into a role in life that, that wasn't necessarily ours to undertake. Okay. We, we follow the family business or we go to the same universities and colleges that our parents did or our brothers and sisters and so on and so forth. And the further down you are in the pecking line of your siblings, <clears throat> the more the pressure is for you to continue the family trend or the societal norm whatever that is for, for you in, in the country in which you live and it's no different here in the UK <clears throat> we're a very multicultural society these days um, and each each culture still within the norms of the UK uh, have their own um, stereotypical ways of raising females particularly and increasingly here uh, more and more ladies are, are waking yeah. up and finding their voice. And speaking as somebody who prides herself, as do you all, I'm sure, being an empowered woman who empowers other women, then I, I personally can see a tide that's turning. We're no longer willing to be silenced by society. We're no longer willing to be society, silenced by familial pressures or environmental dictates and and for me it's a very very refreshing change as with all change it's very small at the minute but with each from from small acorns acorns do tall oak trees grow and my wish for this world is that with the women of the world will and continue to do so unite across borders without reference to creed color culture religion and for no other reason than to empower each other to thrive instead of survive. Mm. And, and to do that, we have to overcome the, mm. the stereotyping that, that society and the world at large would, uh, would impinge on us. You know? And it's not easy. It's absolutely not easy to, <clears throat> excuse me, to take a chance on you. We're all of us born to be joyful souls. We're all of us born unique. We all have fingerprints. They set us apart from everybody else on the planet and every other species. If you have an identical twin, they have different fingerprints. We are all of us unique beings and we all of us have the God-given right or whatever higher power you hold dear to do, be and become whatever we want to do. The trick is in being able to do that in a harmonious fashion that doesn't upset our loved ones along the way or cause ripples that we perhaps can't cope with. And that's not always easy, is it? <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of, do, do you want me to carry on? I'm not, I'm not quite sure how long yeah, you want me yeah, to speak. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I could quite literally speak between now and Christmas, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, I think, let me take it back. Let me take you back a little way <clears throat> in time. I, I was born into a into a working class family in in the north of England in 1960. You do the maths. I'm I'm 62 this year, and for for the whole of my life up until 10 years ago, I I very firmly followed the subliminal dictates of my family. Mm. The girls stayed home to cook and clean. Now, my husband will vouch very loudly, I'm sure, if he was here, that, that cooking and cleaning is not my forte. I married a man who would make somebody a very good wife. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but when I married him, he could neither cook nor clean. You know, I, I, he's, a, he's the elder of four, five siblings, four of them are men, four brothers. 
And and I remember his mother once saying to me very, very early on, you can't talk to our Paul like that. It'll upset him. And I went, if he doesn't like it, there's a door. <laughs> yeah, and and we're, we've, we've been married almost 40 years now. So I think it's, we're, in, we're a safe bet, you know. However, <laughs> he had a very, very steep learning curve because my, my, my relationship with my own parents was such that, that at the hands of my mother, uh, I sort of a lot of physical trauma, emotional abuse, that type of thing. And, and what I didn't know then was that was she was repeating her childhood cycle. My grandmother, mm. her mother was a very strong woman who brought two daughters up on her own in the war after her husband died, working three jobs. She was a very strong lady. And, and that came down, I think, through through my mother. I think it bypassed my mother, to be fair to a bless her. But it definitely it definitely bypassed itself to me because I became she was my best friend until she died when she was when I was 11 years old. Mm. My father, on the other hand, was very much a working class man. He was a miner. My brother grew up to be a miner. His father was a miner and and all and my mother's father was a miner. It was a family. It, if it could have been the family business, it would have been the family business and we'd have all been rich. So that would have been a different story, I guess. But in that mix, my brother was very definitely primed, programmed, if you like, to be the man of the family. He's, he's, he's exactly a year and 10 days younger than I am. And to this day, we are still arguing who's the who's the senior sibling. <laughs> I'm your brother. You'll do as I'm told. Really? I've got a husband that I've been married to for 40 years and it's not working with him. It ain't going to work with you, bro. It's just not happening because we're all individuals. It doesn't matter to me what what gender we are. It doesn't matter if we're non-binary, if we are gay. It doesn't matter. I don't care if you are black. Like gay, straight, Christian, Asian, Asian, Muslim, Jew, or anything else, they're just labels. Mm -hmm. they're labels. Labels are for things we buy in shops. They're not for human beings. We are human beings not doing. I very yes. quickly learned in my life not to do as I was told and to be what I wanted to be. But as I grew, the pressure on me became more intense. I was the elder of four siblings myself. It was very definitely my remit within the family to care for said siblings, three mm. of them younger than me, at an age these days that if I was left looking after three siblings at that age, we'd all end up in social care, <laughs> wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> but it was a different time and it was a different world and that's fine. And mm. I know now that our parents, all of our parents, did the best they could with what they had at the time they had it and none of us can be blamed for not knowing what we didn't know we didn't know yes mm -hmm. and the generational thing the karmic what i call the karmic shizzle the stuff that we carry forward from generation to generation to generation it's each of us incrementally to make sure that the good stuff is paid forward mm -hmm. karmically to our children and and mm -hmm. the not so stuff is left behind my my son, our son, I get into trouble for saying my son. Uh, our son, he's 35 this year. And my dad came to visit one day when, when Matthew was about 18 months old. And at that time, he was he was pushing around a, a toy vacuum cleaner on the living room carpet. And my father walked in and went, what's he doing with that? I said, he's learning how to help mommy clean up. He went, he's a boy. And I went, and this is my house. And he's going to grow up and he's going to learn how to clean his own mm -hmm. house. He's going to make somebody a lovely wife. If you don't like that, there's the door. And my husband's like, you can't talk to your dad like that. <laughs> and because he had his daughter, me and my dad, I was very blessed with my father. He was a, he's the polar opposite of my mother, actually. He was very definite in his, in his ways that he thought women should behave and women should act and women should da, 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 da. and and he he passed away about eight years ago and the very last thing he said to me was how proud he was of me that not only had i overcome the journey that i subsequently undertook mm -hmm. but that he'd lived to see me do it and that means more to me than anything mm -hmm. because i know that despite all his protestations that i should stay at home and cook lunch on sundays no um that he loved me and he was proud of me and I think when we know that, when we're securing that love within our families, we can we can 
we can embrace that as individuals and pay that forward to our own children. I got lost along the way very, very early on in my life, thanks to the negative input, shall we say, from my mother. And I'm not sure how many of you know very much about my story, but a very potted history was I, I remember um, my first beating that I remember at the hands of my mother. I cannot have been any more than 18 months old. And when I described it to my father one day, he was stunned. He went, you can't possibly remember that. And I went, trust me, I do. Mm. And then I went on to recant more stuff. But I learned how to behave. I learned mm -hmm. not to irritate people. I make a career out of irritating people these days, to be fair. I think I'm getting my own back. But I learned how not to irritate people. I knew how to laugh, but I learned how to be quiet. I knew how to play, but I learned how to sit still. I knew how to be happy, but I learned how to be sad. And it carried on. And it carried on until I was 18 and I had my first major nervous breakdown. That triggered a long cycle of um, prescription drug use, which was mismanaged. You know, my grandmother stereotypically once said to me, people like us never question doctors, lawyers or policemen. She'd have a field day for the life today. 321, God bless her. But if she was here now, that that. Um, <laughs> the irony is not lost on me, to be fair. But... Mm -hmm. I trusted my GP, my doctor, when he said, you need to take two of these every day for six weeks and you'll be as right as ninepence. And, and that man was a genius. He was a god. I was upper. I was happy. I was, what I didn't know was I was absolutely stoned off my head. Mm -hmm. He'd given me a prescription to take two diazepam twice a day for six weeks. Mm -hmm. Diazepam in 1978 was the single biggest prescribed tranquilizer in the United States alone. Wow, He'd not given me an antidepressant. He'd given me a tranquilizer. I didn't know. He told me to take it for six weeks. He didn't say, take it for six weeks and then come back and we'll wean you off it. I did as my grandmother told me. I trusted my doctor. I didn't question him. Trust me, I've had so many arguments with my doctors this last five years. It's unbelievable. <laughs> But I crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. I literally thought I'd lost my mind. What I didn't know was happening was that I was in complete withdrawal, detox. And mm -hmm. it triggered two things in me. It triggered a complete mistrust in doctors. Bizarrely, not in things that my grandmother had taught me. Not quite worked that one out yet. Mm -hmm. It triggered a complete mistrust in, in, in the medical system in this country and, and, and also of medication. If I couldn't trust a doctor to prescribe me, let alone manage it properly, how could I do it myself? So it triggered a cycle where I would not be medicated for my Ill, mental ill health, which was significant. And at the times I wasn't medicated, I was drinking. It's, an, it's, it's a very deep rabbit hole. Yeah, spiral very quickly into it if you're not careful. I had my first alcoholic drink when I was 18. By the time I was 52, I was admitted to hospital 24 hours away from dying with end-stage liver failure. Mm -hmm. All that time, yes. I had not wanted to pass my woes on to other people. I had not wanted people to see me to be unable to cope. I was a woman. I, and I, by this time, I'm married. I've got three kids. We've got five grandkids now. I needed to cope. I needed to be able to do what I'd been brought up to do, which was be a wife and a mother. And, and it nearly killed me. Mm -hmm. And these days, I know better. And as Maya Angelou once said, when you know better, you do better. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I do what I do these days. And, and, okay. and as irritating and as annoying as it is for some people in my life, then they just have to learn to deal with that because I'm coming from a place where they will not have to make the same mistakes because they will know better mm -hmm. now. And their children will know better now. We don't have to wait until we grow up to learn these lessons. Okay. lessons. And I think that's a stereotype mistake that worldwide we make. We think we don't have, to, we don't need to tell the kids that yet. Right. And, yeah. and part of my language is bullshit. You need to tell the kids now. I believe if, uh -huh. if a girl asks us a question or if a boy asks us a question, we need to call 
judgment and give them an age stage appropriate response okay. and they'll accept that and then the next time they ask a little bit later another age stage appropriate response my 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 father's disgust at my son pretending to vacuum our living room floor was short-lived because by the time my son was 16 he joined the military and the first thing they teach you do, to do in the military in this country mm. is iron your clothes <laughs> Not surprisingly, my father was extremely proud of the fact that his grandson had joined the military. He passed out of his military college with honours. And, and of course, he learned to iron. He had to iron his uniform. So in my father's head, a man ironing was now acceptable. Mm. We're all, we, all of us, generationally, grow to what we know. We can't help it. We grow towards what we know. And I think it's our remit, all of us in this room, as as thought influencers and agents of change to make sure that that ripples out not only by our own children but into the wider communities that we all of us aim to serve on the levels that we aim to serve them there there is no place for pigeonholing for stereotyping i don't care who or what you are you do not have to play up to a label sorry sorry to interrupt you sir, but i would love to ask you a question now you have a and an enrich and, and, and powerful story, personal story, you know? So how, how we could empower women, just not to become rebels, but just to, to, to become uh, smart and, and, and to know how to adapt to a society that, that is negative. The society I, I, became against you. So how you, you could challenge that society and how we could empower from this platform that they're dedicated to that, you know? I, I think the way to go forward for me is I mean every was it Lao Tzu that said every journey begins every a journey with ten thousand ten thousand steps a journey will will begin with one step for each of us globally um, we all of us have to be prepared to take that first step for us but we all of us have to understand particularly women I believe that everything begins and ends with us absolutely everything. Yeah. Everything we think about, we start to, we begin to speak about, we become to act like, act out into public life. We believe it to be true. And before we know where we are, we believe the story. We're telling ourselves, I'm not good enough. I'm not clever enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm black. Enough already. We're all of us enough. We just don't know it yet. So for me, it's a case of educating literally one person at a time. And there's an African proverb that said, if you, if you educate a man, he will feed his family. If you educate a woman, she she can she will educate the nation. You know, and, and, I, and I think you know that's the way forward. Women have such an integral part to play in in the new world order, if that's what's coming. Certainly, post COVID, things are changing. And my wish for everybody is that every woman, and particularly via platforms like this, can own and step up to their own truth. That's not largely going to be a truth that other people like, mm -hmm. particularly depending on culture and so on. And it's not easy. The first way that they have to go is to remember that unless we look after ourselves, unless we educate ourselves, unless we are healthy, unless we are 100% non-negotiable in our own lives as women, we're not much used to the rest of the world, let alone our families. It has to begin here, way before it begins here. Because okay. this is where the feelings come. Our emotional brain is our heart. Yeah. What we think doesn't stop us from doing anything. What we believe we can't do is what it's, stops us from doing everything. Yeah. And it's making that shift within the hearts first, followed by the minds of the women that we seek to empower. If we believe we can do something, that self-belief gives the wings to fly, the courage to fall, the confidence to get straight back up and fly again and keep getting back up until we get it right. And knowing that there's no shame ever in failure. <laughs> I don't know about you ladies, but I fail forward in this in my life, usually flat on my face, many times weekly. And, and it's... It's a habit that I am increasingly leaving behind, but it's been hard work because the people around us, Ma, don't like it. 
They don't like the fact that we have suddenly developed a spine. They don't like the fact that we've suddenly found our voice mm. and our opinions, and we're not afraid to voice them. Doesn't mean that we're preaching to people, but we've a right to be heard. Yes. Every single person on this planet has the God-given right to be heard. And I think with many women, or at least many of the women that I work with, they are frightened to speak out for fear of upsetting those they love, for fear of creating waves within the family, for fear of grandmothers not loving them anymore. But in all honesty, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm very big on quotes because I think they get the point home. Our eldest granddaughter is 20 years old now. She calls me the nonny. That's what they call me, nonny. You're the queen of quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you that because these people who came before me and all of us, they knew a lot. You know, Dr. Zeus got it right. Those that mind don't matter. Those that matter don't mind. And if we are secure in the love of and for ourselves, we can be reasonably confident that at least... Half of our families and loved ones are going to love what we do. And even if they don't understand it, they will support us despite that because their love is unconditional. Mm -hmm. But unless our love for ourselves is also unconditional, things like setting firm, fair boundaries and standing up for ourselves and owning our truth and finding our voice tend not to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not an easy path, especially in male dominated societies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. That's brilliant. Uh, Amirami, you are a psychologist. What do you think about this, this uh, everything starts from us? It's not, if we, we are going to become egocentric, everything is us, so, so we don't have to, we are fearless, so everything we have to, to build our own inner strength, and nothing more is, is that, it's all about that. What do you think? Uh, before I could go to that, I just want to just share something. So if you see uh, with, uh, with Indians, they always have a feeling that Westerners have a very uh, different lifestyles and they are very free. There is no gender bias or something like that. When Sue mentioned about it, I always used to argue with my uh, you know, friends and uh, other people who talk about Western culture and things like that. So everywhere they have their own, uh, you know, uh, brackets or stereotypes or any uh, <laughs> labels everywhere it is there so when so mentioned about this you know vacuuming so this happens in uh, india a lot when a, you know when a child, woman is uh, woman is pregnant the first thing you know the blessing will come okay let it be a boy yeah so and none of the boys was gender usually the earlier if now it's different a little different but usually the boys are never allowed to do the household work like when she said the vacuum that's that's something like you know different so uh so when when we see all these things like it is all the same everywhere but only the intensity of what we are going through or what we are facing everywhere the systems the practices they have their own things the limitations are there but only thing is we just don't know what we are going through but the only thing is now that we know that the, now the world is in a, in our hands, like how we are all from different countries sitting and talking, we have to know about each other's culture and we are trying to understand. Of course, there are stereotypes, there are brandings and labels, which we are trying to come out of it. And uh, will it be possible completely to come out of it? As a society, it's going to take a time. But as an individual, when we start changing every individual, it's definitely going to change the society also. Absolutely. That's, that's Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Avirami. So in that, in that path that you take in your life, do you feel that it was a lonely struggle? Do you think that the society help you in some, in some way? Or there could be a, a different structure for the society that we could deliver and we could help. And, and you think in that moment, you go back uh, two decades ago in your life, you say, ah, if I could have that, it would be, it would be helpful for me. Yeah, I think, um, and, uh, and I can only speak from, from my experience in this country, but I think the infrastructure that we exist within in the UK 
is is very broken at the minute that that's that's not a political statement on my part it's a fact um and it was broken way before covid um which is a whole different ball game but i think for me i don't i was so far down the rabbit hole of denial i i was i was what i now i was then what i now call a professional swan i i these days i work with professional swans and you'll know who i mean when i say those of us that give the impression of gliding serenely through life without a care in the world and we've got everything under control and all the while underneath the surface we're paddling like crazy just to stay afloat i was that person i was the epitome of that person i would say yes when no would suffice i didn't know any better mm. why didn't i know any better because in this country at that time there wasn't anywhere that i could have gone to learn things like mindfulness and meditation and holistic skills they just did not exist even as even as far back as 20 or 30 years ago i think probably about 20 years ago the first yoga studios and gyms started to pop up in this country but even so they were then immediately um taken over by muscle men who wanted to press weights and be men and, and the ladies got a little tiny piece of the gym in the corner if they were lucky so so the, for me i was my own worst enemy the infrastructure wasn't there to support us and even now today i don't know what, again I, you, you tell me if it's different in your countries ladies but in this country you have been lucky in the last even pre-covid you've been lucky in the last 10 years if you can get more than five minutes with your doctor in the in his office when you go and see him about something you know, and if it's anything to do with mental well-being, like mine was, they literally <laughs> give you a piece of paper and say, "Ring IAPT." IAPT is, is the um, it's a talking therapy service that which is on our national health service, which is for free. And you ring the person, and they've never met you, they don't know you, they talk to you for five minutes and tell you there's nothing you can they can do for you, and you go around in circles. Wow. So, so for me, I've sort of bypassed that 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 whole um that whole scenario and and the way that i work with people when it's whether it's in groups like this or or in networking or in events or whatever one-to-one -one, it doesn't matter i work to help people to understand that unless and until that we are all of us willing to take accountability for where we are in our lives right now and that includes everything that's gone before us that when we we have very little chance of building ourselves up and breaking through the stereotypical norms that society think is our label to carry um i i, I can't remember the last time i cooked a sunday lunch i can't i can't remember i, I don't think i've ever cooked a christmas lunch now i cooking is just not my thing i'll cook i'll gladly cook but you'll probably die quite <laughs> 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 not to and and am i a good i can cook clearly i can i mean i, I you know I'm, I'm not i'm not a complete idiot when it comes to cooking I, I wouldn't starve to death if i lived on my own but i grow to my strengths in this part of my life i i allow myself to grow to my strengths my husband mm -hmm. grows to his strengths and he gets he gets really antsy if i go in the kitchen and try and help these days because <laughs> i'm his domain he thinks he's Jamie Oliver or somebody. I don't know, but but so we've sort of been a role reversal. When it comes to the wider world, I think too many women, particularly, are still too insecure within themselves to do what they say they've always wanted to do. It doesn't matter what that is. It, it doesn't. It, it might be they they want to stay home, be a homemaker, and have half a dozen children, but their husband only wants two. You know, and they don't have the courage to have the difficult conversation. So I think we need to encourage women to have more and more difficult conversations yep. with themselves, firstly, with their spouses, partners, children, parents, whoever their significant others are, mm -hmm. secondly, and then see, see, where, see where they go. Nothing happens until something happens. And when, it, when everything begins and ends with us which i genuinely now these days i don't only believe it i know it to be true because the day i woke up and smelled the coffee instead of the chardonnay my life changed for the better 
it's a bit of a wake up call when your doctor comes and says, well, actually you've won the battle, not the war, you're still dying. And you go, what? I, when I was told that, I didn't know how, if or when I would walk out of that hospital, but I made myself a mental promise that if I did things would change for the better and I would no longer allow myself to be a prisoner to my own emotions, let mm. alone my thought, and it was a thought that other people wanted of me. None of us know what we don't know. And if, we, if we're not prepared to have those difficult conversations with those we love, let alone ourselves, then, then there's very little we can do. I think we can encourage that by creating safe spaces such as this, Yes. for women to come together and meet and and do so in a safe space that they know in the early days the editing is, 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 is not not back to the people they will perhaps be unwilling for it to be shared with you know we've all of us got a right to privacy but it's getting through the barrier of fear the fear of what if i do this what if I do what I want to do? What if I step forward and say, actually, I am going to go and study this, or I am not going to do that job. I am going to do this job. What is the worst that could happen? The thing is, we get ourselves embroiled in the, oh, it's, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. We need to educate people to try and find the middle ground. What's the best that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? What's most likely to happen? you know and, and have the courage having the courage sorry to be who we really are or perhaps more importantly in this conversation who we would like to be mm. is a scary place to be before we take that first step but i promise you and anybody else that i ever speak to and work with there isn't anything only growth on the other side of our fears we have to first become comfortable before we can get more comfortable in our stretch zone and at that point we then have to get uncomfortable again before we can be more comfortable and in this way we live we learn we grow that's the message that we need to get out to to anybody particularly women and especially if they're laboring under a societal label or a mm -hmm. cultural label that they don't want to own as their own mm -hmm. so educating uh, women or, or men to become what they wanted to be within yeah. their own challenge in their society. You have started talking about UK. What do you think the rest, please? What, what is in Michigan? What is in, in, in LA? What is in Canada? Is different. That's why we started with culture, traditions, religion. Yeah. How it impact to become themselves. We impact more in one religion than the other, in one country than other. UK, UK is one of the most developed society. It's considered the most developed society. You know, so so when I start compare, I, I start feeling, you know, embarrassed, you know, we go from from here from Spain because we are more traditional. So if, if in UK they had the challenge, you can imagine here. So what what happened in Canada, what happened in, in, in LA or in your country, Bridget? or Tanya, what's your experience, your idea? Yeah, with... Yes, Bridget, Bridget. Great question, Mark. Here in LA, as many of, of us know here, it is the, uh, it's the entertainment capital of... Uh, uh, one of the entertainment capital of the world. <laughs> and, and it is to say that in many other places in the world, you see this on TV on the magazine and so forth here you see this walking out of your house <laughs> it depends on where in la if you are anywhere close to beverly hills if you're anywhere close to um hollywood and and multiple other neighborhood in here it is you walk out and people dress in certain manner and and so forth so it is immensely um so many uh, so many messages in here in such a way that you got to look this way. In, in And many of them are even indirect message that is for, for younger women growing up, uh, younger women navigating how to become themselves. It's bombarded, not just from, from the media. If you get out of your house, if you have somebody come to your house even to, to, to you know, <laughs> or something like that, then it's 
everywhere. It's everywhere, and it can be very uh, quite quite a quite a journey to discover yourself. It is uh, you you go to work if you work, but anywhere here, if you work mm -hmm. uh, you in a hospital, mm -hmm. and every New Year, every New Year, you hear people say, "Okay." This is the new diet, and this is the new exercise, and this is the new this, this is the new that, and it is amazing. It is amazing uh, how much commercialization really of uh, everything that <coughs> that is this society, particular uh, in the U.S. I would say in general, but in, in in L.A. in particular, so much so that we know that. The, the, uh, LA is one of the places that the rates are for it, uh, for good reasons, the rates of psychological disorder, of bulimia, of anorexia, and so forth is even with this new day and age where we have more awareness, it's still just leading the world basically. It is it's, it's, awareness, awareness, awareness of an overall global awareness is needed for sure. <laughs> But again, that self-awareness, we need to unlock the key of self-awareness, you know, to, to, to I, I mean, I, I've never, I've never been to America yet. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't let me in to be fair, but, <laughs> um, but I, I have many friends who've been to Hollywood and have said, you know, they've evidenced exactly what you've just said. And, and, and I, I, you probably can tell, or maybe you can't on these cameras, if I was any more low maintenance, I actually would be dead. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, there is nothing worried about it. I, 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 get, I, mean, I, I, I am sat here. I've got no shoes and socks on. I've got some old scrub pants from the hospital on, and I've and I've just from the from the belly up. I've sort of made a reasonable effort, and and my kids have an absolute fit, and they're like, "Mother, you can't go out looking like that." And I said, "The thing is, when I'm dressed, I don't look at me. I don't go around looking at myself in shop windows or preening my hair. I know I'm clean. I know I'm tidy. I know I'm presentable, and I'm happy, and I have." literally one full half hanging rail of clothes and one half of a long hanging rail of clothes in my wardrobe that's it my kids when i actually do drop off my perch it'll take them about five minutes to pack my stuff up and send it to the charity shop not a problem i'm doing i keep saying i'm doing you a favor you don't have all my shit to call to sort out when i'm dead but i i i as a young person in the uk i bought into those stereotypes i bought the platform boots I went down to the local chemist and I bought the local, uh, bought the then L'Oreal lipsticks and whatever, and I felt like a fraud. Mm. I felt like a fraud. It wasn't me, and and I'm and I am proud. I mean, don't get me wrong. If I go out to a dinner or if I'm speaking at an event, you know, then I actually don't re recognize me when I look at myself, you know. But I know I'm in here and in here, so that's fine now. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not hiding behind the people that you're talking about. They are hiding behind what they think society wants mm -hmm. our our younger daughter is is if i say it myself i'm pretty sure i picked the wrong child up and i left for a hospital she's beautiful she's absolutely beautiful but she's buying into the culture in this country at the minute and if she ever sees this she's gonna kill me she's buying into the culture in this country at the minute where you know the lips are pouting and they're all puffed put up and they've got suction on them and i'm like matt you you're too beautiful to do that to yourself what are you doing and she she doesn't believe it and therefore she's you know she's striving to be what she thinks is the norm and mm. what's the norm is is not it, it's not it's not normal to be that or normal if that's even a word you know, it, it, you know we there are no such things as zero size models you know if you take any celebrity in hollywood and knock on the door and they answer it five minutes after they've woken up in the morning you are not going to see any of them looking remotely like they do on the front of the newspapers and magazines it's all a facade we need to stop we need to come out from behind the veil of that facade and we need to help our young people to understand that that's okay right well have you heard with what sue and bridget two different societies mm facing a different challenge. What do you think from Canada? Would, what do you think this impact of the media, of the virtual platform, how much we need to are in the, against that? How, how we are going to tackle that challenge that is the virtual platform? There are empowering tools for the women and at the same time, they could go against them and make, our, and repli make us replicate a unique model, the only model 
that is, and I say with irony, no, that is the unique, the unique model. Hey, Paula, please. I think you have to leave, isn't it, Paula? You have to leave in yes. a few minutes. So please, please tell. What I, what I would say on this is to remind ourselves that there are many subcultures within societies. The first society we live in is our own family. So when the family actually puts on those pressures or those demands on you, then we each have as female uh, the, the right and the ownership and as well the responsibility to figure out is it working or not for me and <clears throat> i would say the conversation might be difficult in some areas but you can only start with you if we want to change at the societal level we have to start doing things different my kids were not raised exactly the way my parents raised me there are things I remember I was raised with the, the sense of you have to dress the part, you have to speak proper, you have to lower your voice because otherwise it sounds too menacing. And <clears throat> even when you laugh, it has to be in such a way that it looks delicate. So in that conversation, you have to own up to who you are and figure out what it is. There's a downside to, uh, to getting to know yourself. And as Sue has mentioned, it's this part, other people might not like who you're coming back with. And I know for me and my kids, as we were uh, raising them, uh, raise them to speak their mind and to be true to self. So sometimes as a parent, you might want them to fit a certain mold where it's like, okay, right now it's for me, for you to follow what I said. And then they tell you why. And you raise them to ask why. So this is the part where as parents, as women, as societies, we have to look at what are we passing on? Is it still serving us as a society, as individuals, as um, women? And we're still in most of the world in a patriarch patriarchal environment. Yes. So the men dominate what it is that we're meant to see. So if I'm watching a show and everything is about what men think women should be, I'm like, you know what? That's on you. It's not on me. I figure out what it is that I want. Some people are going to like you and some people are not. And we as women are raised in such a way that we are meant to be liked by everyone. Sorry about that and doing that for you. So it's this part where as each woman finds her place, because not every woman would have the same angst with the, some of those um, boundaries or uh, molds that are put on her but she has to make her own choice. The same way I make the choice that works for me, I have to acknowledge that other women might be comfortable in that environment. Mm -hmm. So it's figuring out, but you're the only one who can check your pulse. You're the only one who can check your mental health. If I am, I am tired of smiling because that's what they want and I'm thinking I'm about to kill someone, then guess what? Something's happening. Check it out. Yeah. What is it about? Something has why, to give, doesn't it? Is mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, something has to give. Definitely. Something has yeah. to give. Something you, you have to, to make a choice for yourself. And as women, we're, we learn early on that choosing you is the selfish option. Absolutely. So we have to all learn that. Because and choosing you is about survival. Mm -hmm. and every single time that you make a choice pile, what it's... is best for you, it's about yeah. living my life truly, authentically, but also surviving in that set of other circumstances, other individuals that might have a different path. As till, until we figure those out, then it's a different conversation. So one conversation at a time. I keep telling my children, you build relationship one conversation at a time. It is scary at times where you either have to 
check someone for something they said or something they believe and you're like <clears throat> i think i beg to differ and then blah 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 you can't only you can only pull someone further if they're willing to come along if not then you have to let it sit for them to figure out hmm yeah what does that really mean for me and that would be female as well as male but i have to be honest I spend a lot more time on females than I spend on males because as we've mentioned earlier, women build communities. Women will make the change happen. Men are comfortable in their zone right now because it is their rules. It is their way of doing. They're benefiting. Not to say they're selfish. They're just benefiting. I could not have gone so far in my life and never learn how to cook. But I choose to cook what I like. Yeah. I might cook for other people. I still choose to cook what I like. Yeah. If you want something else, yay. Check where you can get it. Here's a cooking book. Enjoy. And those yeah. are the things we want to, to get to a point where there's that sense of equity. You have as much right as anybody else to be hurt. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. to live a life where you feel in your place and not always out of place. And only you can tell when you feel out of place. Nobody else can. Some people might wonder, but that choice belongs to the individual. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's whether or and not we have the courage to tell others that we're not okay. And we don't want to speak. We, we feel we have to justify ourselves and actually we don't. Right. And I think that that's what I work with individuals. I said, no is a complete sentence. Absolutely. So I use that every you said day. no, that's fine. When you start to justify yourself, I said, you realize you don't have to. If it's a no, yeah. it's a no. If there's anything else I can help you with, then that's fine. But mm -hmm. it's just the sense where um, I don't want to be the individual working with a female and take her choice away. I want her to walk in and be fully present and acknowledge that she's doing it for herself. She's not doing it for me. Because if she's doing it for me, she's going to get out and somebody else will talk to her and she said, okay. Right. She's not doing it for herself. And that's the part where we have to appreciate as we're working with the individual, we have to take them where they are. Some people will be a slow motion forward. Some people will be a big jump. And even in the case of a big jump, we might be hmm, accounting for a bit of a few step back and then move forward again because yeah. it, they have to get into that experience where they realize it's on me. It's my choice. This is what I want. And this is how I'm going to get it. Because I can't be your conscience. I don't want anybody else to be my conscience. Makes no sense. So why would I want to, and to know that that's, that's and to know that that's okay. Mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and totally, totally your pain. Equally to know that it's okay for us not to be okay and not to be afraid to say, that I'm not just okay. for today, I'm actually not going to do that. Just for today, I'm going to do what I want to do for me. Does that make sense? And let's just say for me, no. I don't even say just for today. Yeah. I would say, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Yeah. No. I can suggest yeah. somebody I'm, else. I, I meant, I meant well, this is how I talk to myself. I don't I don't ever say yeah. that to somebody else. Because yeah. that would be, you know. <laughs> Give a dog a but sometimes we also have to rationalize ourselves yeah. and think about why is it that I'm thinking this way? Uh, mm -hmm. I love dressing. Trust me, I love dressing. And some it's days okay. I'm like, I don't feel like dressing. Oh, but I have a meaning. Okay, so what would be the in between where I, I am covered up and looking professional, but then at the same time I feel oh, totally casual? So as Sue has mentioned, the up might look like, hey, and then the bottom is just like, I just rolled out of bed. Yeah. So I call it the new syndrome. Yeah. If what? 
<laughs> the newsreader syndrome. Everybody sits there on the news. I mean, you know, gear up the perfect. I'm pretty sure they've all got pajamas on under the desk. But then at the same time, I'll be honest with you, I love dressing. So I've, I'm still not able to get to that casual effect. And that's okay because that's me. But if somebody <laughs> is okay I, with that, absolutely. I we're all good. People, yeah, I say to people all the time if it's right for you, it's right. Period. Mm -hmm. There isn't anybody that has the right to tell you that you can't go up as you long up as you're right. not infringing on somebody else's. Absolutely. And that's the part. It. There's always, you know, we all have our bubble. But you'll have yeah. to understand when yours finish and when you're pushing your ways into somebody else's. Yeah. So for me, it's always that I'm always conscious of my environment. I'm always conscious of the relationship. I'm always conscious of what it is that I have and that I want for me because I also have a relationship with myself. So yeah. what I want is for all women to build that relationship and not think that everything comes from the outside because yeah. it doesn't. No. It comes from you. And until you figure out what it is that you want, you're just somebody else's puppet. Period. Absolutely. And that's and, not and, what and we, we have. We have to learn to, as, as females particularly, but I mean, I say this to male clients sometimes and they look at me as I'm stupid. And I was like, but it, it counts for them too. But mm -hmm. more so for females, we really, 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 really do have to learn how to love ourselves unconditionally. Mm -hmm. without shaming, blaming, or guilting ourselves into into falling for somebody else's um, agenda, for want of a better expression. Mm -hmm. Self-care, self-love, in my world these days, is an act of sanity, not vanity. Yeah, well, no, it's not an act of survival. It, yeah. It's your sanity, it's your survival. I can't function if somebody else is controlling me, period. It, it's the aeroplane, oxygen, it isn't. If I'm not breathing from my oxygen mask, I'm no good to the people I love. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to fall into the realms of burnout and overwhelm and stress and all that business, you know. And uh, and I am, I don't know about you ladies or anybody that's watching this, but these days I, and have for the last sort of 10 years or so, I have at least a one hour appointment with myself every single day. Scheduled mm -hmm. into my calendar so nobody can book in to speak to me or be with me during that time. I have reminders on my phone 30 minutes in advance. My me time, it's a bright yellow background with a great big smiley face on it. It pops up on my phone and it just goes, me time. And I just turn off. And I might go for a walk or I might go for a swim or I might just read a book. But I tune out of the world and I tune back in when I'm good and ready. Uh, and and it make, it's the difference that makes the difference and keeping me sane. Well, right. To be fair, there would be some people that argue that that doesn't work, but <laughs> um, but that's okay because that's my kind of insanity. Mm -hmm. uh, Paula, Paula had, has to leave, uh, but thank you so much, Paula, for your wisdom, your experience, yeah. and your sense of humor always. Tanya, what do you yeah. think about this? We we have been with this empowered, empowered, powerful river as Sue and and Paula. They have have taken the challenge to be herself and with that yeah. success. Have you taken that challenge? Are oh. you yourself, or you are still conditioned by a, by a, by the pressure of your society? Well, I find that I have reached that point, but those there are still little drags of the pressure that pop up. But there are wonderful takeaways from what Sue and Paula both had to say, and really concentrating on you and loving you is mental health. It's not being frivolous. It's not being vain. It's taking care of your own mental health. And I'd really like to see more women to grasp that concept. Mm -hmm. Also having the hard conversations, the difficult conversations, and it will take one conversation at a time for us to make these different transitions, but they are necessary. I've had examples like in my own life, for instance, being a newlywed many years ago, I thought that I had to iron my husband's shirts and all because that's what I saw mom do. He was hovering around the ironing board and I didn't know what was going on. Well, he was used to doing his own ironing. I had to make that mental adjustment not to feel reprimanded or not to feel like I was less than because I could not 
iron his shirts. No, let him iron his own shirts. That's what he likes to do. He does a much better job. Mm -hmm. As I began to have children, he grocery shopped. He said he did a better job. He has that job. It's not mm -hmm. a traditional male role for us in this particular society. More recently, I've seen my dad take care of my mom, who can't do some things that we that she's having difficulty with some leg and ankle issues. So he's doing all the laundry and the cooking. There are changes that need to be made. And I think that as COVID has entered our lives, there were different adjustments that had to be made by many people. Some men made those difficult transitions, others did not. Mm -hmm. But these are very important things to consider and to talk about and have those difficult conversations. If people are hanging on to some of their maybe spiritual or uh, yeah, their spiritual nurturing, whatever their sacred text is, and they have the conversation about submission. If you look a little further, you'll see it talks about mutual submission, not just women submitting to men, but the man is supposed to submit to the woman in the ways that she needs to because he is a partner in this and actually should take lead in um, making that a good home. If we really look at it and I and the little dregs that stick with me of societal pressures have to do with how I present myself to the world. You know, I can't leave the house without a dressed face, I was told once upon a time. So the liberation for me is to be comfortable during this COVID season not to put makeup on because I had to wear a mask. And if I have to take it off and someone sees me with that makeup, so what? <laughs> you know, we're all here in the same boat. This is where we are. We sharing on this platform, I think is so very, very beneficial because there are so many women as we've all run into and have heard who have a fear of speaking up and being heard. They need to know that they have permission. It's okay to be an individual. You can do that. And in our society, I think that, well, all of our societies, there's a big conversation on uh, equity uh, and inclusion. And I'm almost feeling like women need to be in the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation because of the thoughts that some women and men have on how women should behave and what we should do. So that's a difficult conversation or a conversation that we need to continue and make sure that women are included in that particular thought. Because if you speak up, if you're strong, being looked at differently as being difficult or something like that or less than, or you're not conforming, you're not behaving the way that you should behave. That's a conversation or a thought that needs to be changed. It needs to be updated and including women in the whole diversity, equity and inclusion conversation, I think could be beneficial for all of us. So I'm glad to, to shed some of these past social norms. And of course it comes from, you know, we talked, Ms. Sue mentioned about her parenting that she received. I think about mine and you made a wonderful reference to one of my favorite quotes by Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, you do better. Yeah. And thinking on that daily and realizing and giving them a break and still loving them because they did the best they could is important. But I know that there are a lot of the programs that I fight against, I know come from how dad mentioned certain things about not being so loud. Don't be a barrel house Bessie. So sometimes my voice is barely audible in areas where I need to speak up and make a point. And I know where that comes from. So it's a daily decision and a moment by moment decision to be that woman that you need to be. But I'm enjoying the, the growth. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Tania. We need to go now. We have a couple of minutes. Uh, please, Abirami, Bridget, Sue, your your quick conclusion. Uh, yeah, I, I Bridget, yeah. I would say it, I I love how uh, how Paula and Sue says you know it's it's okay to be yourself and it's a survival for me and for some of you you might say well yeah it's a survival but many many times we as women we are we're very altruistic we are always worrying about other we we have a tendency to want to care about other people mm -hmm. let me tell you it's not only survival it is not only okay to be yourself to be who you feel the best and and for some of us for some of us for whatever reason you like to look you look like to look pretty at times and that's okay too it doesn't mean that you should never wear makeup or it doesn't mean that you should always wear makeup it's what you feel at the moment for me it's actually surfing you are surfing not just yourself but other people when you are being yourself and why because we all of us all of us we we will be able to create the best and serve the best when you are comfortable with yourself if you feel you are limited by the, so the social media by your neighbor by whomever by your family member or particularly by yourself about concept on how you're going to be then you're not going to be able to serve as your best fullest potential mm -hmm. you're limited and you're limiting yourself so it's not only it's in addition to its survival, in addition to it being okay, it's actually surfing. And so just think about that. At any time you say, oh, well, you know, what other people think? Just know that if you really want to surf, you got to come from the first place. You, be who you are, allow yourself to grow, and then you'll be able to fully help others to grow. And then, Bridget, Bridget, thank you, Bridget. Bridget is a woman who have written the book Seeking Peace. So, so you know why she she's so wise on on her on her thoughts. Uh, Abirami, please, your your psychology interpretation of this. We 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 are, we are uh, being you know more than me today. I know. I I got to listen to. I got to listen to Sue and uh, uh, everyone. It was really nice. But what I would uh, like to add here is wherever you are there in the world, it is not the country, it is not the race or whatever that matters, whether you're a man or a woman, being yourself matters the most. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you have to live up to the expectations of the society. But the moment you feel like doing something, please go ahead and do it. And every, each one of us, have something called we have an intuitive power and that intuitive power you will have something to tell you so that follow that intuition and then do it it's not going to affect any of uh, the societal pressure or anything just go ahead and do it and you will be very happy and peaceful more than being happy peace is more enough more required it will be very nice if we follow ourselves and allow ourselves to live the way we want the way we look as uh, Bridget mentioned, makeup, if you want to, uh, you know, if you feel like uh, having a makeup, just do it. Otherwise, it's not required to please somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Do things for your own self, not for others' sake. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arirami. Thank you. Sue, please. Just okay. uh, one, two minutes. Okay. Um, I, I said, I've said several times uh, in the time that we spent together that everything begins and ends with us. And, and, I, and I say that for, for a very good reason in so far as I realised that almost too late in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I was blessed to stay around and, and not shuffle off to meet the Grim Reaper. And I learned a lot just by surviving. Mm -hmm. But for me, the concept of everything beginning and ends with us literally does mean mm -hmm. everything. You know, self-love self-care personal boundaries saying yes or should i say stop saying yes when no would suffice mm -hmm. putting uh putting a stop to people pleasing all the other agendas that other people have for us as humans that's drain the very life out of us it's within our power to stop everything's a choice i think for me the biggest choice that any of us will ever make is on taking a chance 
to choose to change what we don't like about our lives and or ourselves. And we, we, we look at that choice and we think I don't have a choice, so therefore we don't make a choice. And then we say things like, but I can't choose. Hmm. If you're choosing not to make a choice, by definition, that in itself is a choice and you go around in circles forever. Wherever, whoever's watching this and including the panelists, wherever we all of us are in our lives at this moment in time, every choice or choosing not to make a choice that we've ever taken ever has served to bring us to this point in our lives today. That's inescapable. If we don't like where we are in our lives today, because let's face it, many of us are very, very happy and we don't see the need to change. But if we do not like where we are in our lives today, we need to understand that it's the choices from yesterday that created our todays. If we want better tomorrows, the choices that we make today must be the thing that changes. Every event plus our reaction or response will trigger the outcome. If we want a different outcome for our tomorrows, for the future reality that we've yet to create, we need to make better choices today. Yes, tomorrow will come, and yes, the next day will come, but unless we make that choice and commit to loving ourselves and understanding that everything begins and ends with us, very quickly we'll look forward to a life that has far less time to come than we've already have, have had. Anybody and everybody who watches this, let me ask you this. On balance, today is the youngest that any of us will ever be again, ever. How much longer have you got to left to, to wonder about making the change? How much longer have you got left to take a chance to choose to change? How much longer have you got left to create the reality that you not only desire, but deserve? Only you can make that choice. And only you know the answer to how much you think you've got left. We all of us are born, we will all die. We all of us are gifted 86,400 seconds within any given 24 hour period. It's what we do with those seconds on a daily basis that become the difference that make the difference and are reflective of our choices. Yesterday's gone, today's a gift, tomorrow's yet to arrive. If we don't choose to change and create the future reality that we desire today, tomorrow might never come. Beautiful, so you enlightened this session with your with your present. It was absolutely beautiful. We know that before. Thank you. And that's why you you are here. Uh, bless, you. Uh, bless you too. Tap into your inner. Don't be worried to challenge yourself. Don't expect that any society in the world will deliver the struggle that you don't you don't make with yourself. They will, and, and even if the media is against you, the TV is against you, the virtual platform are against you, it's you. Find another one. There could be platform like this one or like other ones or a religion or a tradition or whatever you could find your inner. So just be able to challenge yourself to the new. That is the message that I would like to leave. And thank you so much, ladies, for, for being here. And see you next session, next month, on this struggle that we have to change this cultural code, or at least to leave a small seed for the young, for the next generation. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. How do I turn myself off? <laughs>